Welcome to episode 312 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of Security First IT, and joining me is Donna Grendel of Card. Good morning, Donna. Well, hello, David. Technically, good afternoon. Yeah, just barely. It recently switched. <laughs> <laughs> While we were chatting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Let's in see. today's episode, we are going to be talking about to offshore or to not offshore. That's that. easy question. That's <laughs> the question. Uh, and so this this comes up because of a question that came to me. We'll talk about that and then dive into it because there's a lot of things to consider when you're mm -hmm. When you're looking at that, and so we'll look at it kind of from two different perspectives, one being, you know, what if you're an MSP and you're looking at that, or maybe you're already doing that, or maybe you're a, a healthcare provider and you're looking at doing that or already doing that, or a vendor doing have, that. Yeah, you have vendors that are doing it and you haven't asked. Mm, that's another thing. That's another thing. Yep. So we'll talk about all that. But uh, first, we do want to announce the HIPAA Bootcamp Virtual Edition, August 2021 has sold out yeah it's it's we've never had them like sell out like this we're so far ahead but uh, we've got a lot of interest and now everybody wants to know when we're doing the next one which will be in 2022 mm -hmm. it shall be so if you're interested in the hippo boot camp you can still go to the hippo boot camp .com. however you will be on next year's list <laughs> well we are taking some wait lists because you know it's this far out sometimes people you know they can't make it things happen mm -hmm. you know, we, we know things happen so if you want to be wait listed for this one uh, shoot us an email contact at help me with hippo dot com. com yep <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and do remember too, if you're in an organization where, you know, you have to put in an annual budget, then, you know, going into the end of 2021, that's something you need to add to your budget for next year. Yeah. And we, we will probably go back to maybe do one virtual and one in person. I don't know. We haven't decided yet. In fact, this is the first time we've talked about it, what to do in 2022. <laughs> yeah. This is the first time the we've not talked been about talking it. About it. <laughs> the team's been talking about it. We haven't been talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's one of those things. It, it really just kind of depends on where, you know, where you are. I know like for around here, uh, you know, things have gone back to quote unquote, mostly normal, but uh, I just came back from DC and things are not that way up there. So it just yeah. depends on where you are and certainly will depend on how things are in, uh, in the Atlanta area, since that's where the, event normally is well and, and in dc you got all this international stuff and mm -hmm. some parts of the world they they're they're in still in deep trouble so uh, we've got a lot of things to watch for before we make decisions mm -hmm. but we definitely are open to ideas of how we could handle this differently mm -hmm. yeah. doesn't mean we'll take them but we're open to the list <laughs> <laughs> send them in uh, uh yeah there's that's good there's so much value to the in-person zoom is the i mean the thing about zoom webinars uh, and, and meetings convenience is the thing i mean it you mm -hmm. can't get more convenient than putting a t-shirt on staying in your pajamas and <laughs> going to a meeting <laughs> um but there is so much value in that in-person meeting whether it's the boot camp or not but but particularly the boot camp it's the questions and the conversations that happen on the peripheral and between the sessions and at lunch and at dinner that's where so much of the value comes from because and that, being completely removed from your environment you're actually immersed you know completely in something different yeah yeah it, it is it's just um it, it's hard to to talk about how much value happens on the peripheral outside of the quote unquote classes. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the value comes in that. Um, Although the, the, the team with the, the crowd is doing it very well mm -hmm. uh, with these back end chats that were going on amongst each other, they were laughing and mm -hmm. chit chatting and we didn't know they were chit chatting. 
until we'd see somebody laugh and then look away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we keep everybody interested. We play games along the way and uh, we tr we try really hard. We ship you a, a boot camp kit. So those of you that are signed up, we uh, we're looking forward to it. And those of you who are interested, you know how to find us. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we got other things to talk about. That's right. So um, before we dive into that, if you like today's show, share it out. If you don't like it, please don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, go leave us a review. We love getting reviews. So review the podcast, leave us five stars. Um, if you're not going to leave five stars, don't leave a review either. <laughs> <laughs> We only want good stuff. We don't want to hear about that. Uh, no. uh, so anyway. we have to be the highest rated HIPAA podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, it's funny. It's, it, if you're a long time listener, you know what the jab's about. So anyway, um, mm -hmm. for those of you who donate to the podcast, we absolutely appreciate it. Your donations go a long way to help us do what we do. And if yes. you want to know more about that, go to the, the website, help me with HIPAA.com. You can find out more there, but now, Drum roll, please. We're going to get into the HIPAA. Say what? <laughs> segment of the week. <laughs> Basically, the whole episode is is it falls under that segment, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. We're going to cover um, CISA. It has released something fairly new, which is interesting. Um, and then we'll get into the the show topic of offshoring or not. But the CISA thing is pretty funny. <laughs> you and I were in a in a meeting together with a bunch of government entities uh, this week, and uh, we found out that the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, better known as CISA, has come up with a bad practices webpage. <laughs> so I thought that was funny because it's like, I guess they figure, okay, if you're not going to follow best practices, then at least look at this page to make sure you're not doing these things. <laughs> because I can take you to the best practices page and you're like, yeah, I'm not doing any of that. Okay, well, if that's your mode, not doing anything that's on the page, then do it, go to this one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, everybody's like, well, that's just, that's too hard to do. Yeah. Okay, well, go over here and make sure you're not doing this. <laughs> right. It's not, you know, it, can you say it's too hard to not do something? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So it's, you know, there'll be people that'll say, you know what, I'm not doing the best practices, but I'm also not doing the bad stuff. So, Hey, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in between. Yeah. Uh, it's at sisa.gov slash bad practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they've just, they're starting slow. They don't want to overwhelm. Nobody yeah. likes to be slapped around, told they're doing everything wrong. Even though that's our job. <laughs> we don't like doing it either. So it's out there and uh, they make a point of saying that they are, uh, they're developing a catalog of bad practices that are exceptionally risky. Mm. Especially if you're in critical infrastructure or NCS and, uh, that's the national critical infrastructure. Either way, healthcare's in there. Mm -hmm. I don't care how you look at it. Uh, you know, national security, national economic security, and national public health and safety is the the NCFs. And critical infrastructure includes public health. So healthcare is in there double time. Yep. Plus a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, you know, they're saying this is exceptionally dangerous and you're increasing the risk to national security, economic stability, life, health, and safety of the public. If that doesn't make you feel responsible, I got nothing else. Yeah. Life, health, and safety. Of, of the, the public. public. Economic stability. National mm -hmm. security. Yeah. And, you know, People in the South East ought to understand the whole economic stability after, <laughs> you know, the colonial pipeline thing. <laughs> yeah, we all saw it. So keeping in mind those things. So any business should think of these as bad practices, but especially those that really could screw the pooch, so to speak, mm -hmm. for the rest of us. Right. So they started with two yeah. and they make, they do make a point while these practices are dangerous, it encourages all organizations to engage in, in 
these uh, necessary actions and critical conversations to address bad practices. But it does not include every possible inadvisable cybersecurity practice. <laughs> I love it. The lack of inclusion of any particular cybersecurity practice does not indicate that CISA endorses such a practice or deems such a practice to present acceptable levels of risk. Yeah, I think that was there specifically for you. Because <laughs> what, what's the saying? Like the the lack of approval implies <laughs> no. The lack of disapproval disapproval implies approval. That's there my you saying. Go. There you go. <laughs> lack of disapproval implies approval. <laughs> so for you, they said the lack of it not being in this list <laughs> doesn't mean it's not a bad practice. <laughs> Well, I've always found it helpful in my lifetime. Lack of disapproval <laughs> implies that you're okay with it. If yeah. you're aware of it, <laughs> and you don't say anything. So that's why we always bring things up. Yeah. Well, you know, to follow that down a rabbit hole a little bit, though, if you think about that thought process, which a lot of people have, if you are running a, a business, a practice, medical practice, and you know about bad things that are happening in your organization and you choose not to do anything about it, it does look like you approve of those things that are happening mm -hmm. in your organization. Yeah. So I mean, that goes that. across the board when it comes to managing people and, and mm -hmm. everything. If, if there is no disapproval, then yeah. and no consequences, then you're basically saying you approve. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've run across people and they're like, yeah, well, you know, boss man knows I'm doing it. He's never said anything about it. Yep. Okay. I mean, he knows we're sharing passwords. Never say anything about it. She she knows we all use the same credentials to log in. Never say anything about it. I mean, you know, list can go on and on. So yeah. think about that when you're the person that's in some type of authority role and you're not pointing out things and going, this is not the way we do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it goes in both directions. So let's do the two. All right. Numero uno. That's the extent of my Spanish. <laughs> uh, use of unsupported or end of life software in service equipment infrastructure. So honestly, anything. <laughs> yeah. But they're saying, remember, they're, they're focusing on critical infrastructure and national critical functions. So everything's going to apply to that. Use of unsupported end of life software mm -hmm. is dangerous and significantly evalu el evaluates, elevates mm -hmm. risk to national security, national economic security, national public health and safety. Mm -hmm. This dangerous practice is especially egregious in internet accessible technologies. Yes, it is. So we've talked about this a million times, mm -hmm. you know, that unsupported meaning end of life and they make that clear. So we're talking to you, Windows XP and Windows 7 and uh, server 2008 or whatever <laughs> it is, uh, you know, or uh, an original, oh, I don't update my iPhone or my Android uh, device because whatever, mm -hmm. and they are not up to date, uh, I can assure you uh, that is now unsupported. Yeah. And just to give you a heads up, Windows 10 end of life is in 2025. Yeah. <laughs> so don't wait till 2025 to plan for it. That's right. Although there's nothing to replace it with right now, it is a Microsoft Windows product. Although I've seen some great cartoons about Windows 11. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one where it's like, uh, where it's the pig and the elephant and the stick. Uh, it's hysterical. Yeah. At any rate, it is also important when we look at other devices. And in healthcare, we talk a lot about connected devices. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that last point of if you have them, but they're never connected to the internet in any way, shape or form, they can't get to the internet and the internet can't get to them. That's very different 
than the scenario where they are fully connected to the internet. Mm -hmm. That is especially egregious. Yeah. The, the problem we run into, especially in the smaller providers is that their networks are typically flat and they don't understand what's connected to so what's the flat, David, what's flat. Um, flat, flat meaning um, that there is no segmentation happening. So basically everything is talking to everything. They are able to talk to each other freely. Yeah. So, you know, think about uh, thinking about the open floor plan of your office where you walk in, there are no cubicles there are no walls or no anything. It's just everybody's in the same room. Mm -hmm. And yes. they can choose to talk to each other and look at each other's work anytime they want. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is just get up and go over there. Yep. So I know a number of times I've been in places where somebody will say, well, this is not connected to the internet. I'm like, it's connected to the network and the yep. network's connected to the internet and it's not segmented out. So it absolutely is connected to the internet. Exactly. Yeah. So there, there is a very important reason that if you have things that don't meet these requirements or, or that are end of life or unsupported, then it is very important that you ask about, are they segmented? That is an actual question you should ask your IT. Mm -hmm. Segmented networks really are important. Yep. More so than ever before. And what that means is everybody's put in a room and then there are controls over which doors can be opened and from where. And only certain traffic can go into the hallway, yep. which is the internet. <laughs> so there you go. That's the back alley. <laughs> yeah, you go. <laughs> the back alley, that door where somebody says, if you, I will go to open that door. That's a whole long story. But anyway, <clears throat> that is the number one bad practice using mm -hmm. into life. And what is number two, David? Well, you know, we can't talk about bad practices without talking about password issues. Yes. <laughs> so the use of known, fixed, or default passwords and credentials in service of critical infrastructure and national critical functions is dangerous and significantly elevates risk to national security, national economic security, national public health and safety. And guess what? It's also egregious. Yeah, the <laughs> phrasing, all they're doing is changing the beginning. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, I mean, they all carry the same level of danger and risk. But yeah, so we're not talking about you shouldn't do this. We're talking this is dangerous and it makes everything you do more risky. Right. And, and there was, and I don't have the details in front of me, but there was recently another massive list of passwords uh, that was, that was released to, um, uh, to the dark web and, and probably even <laughs> the clear web even, mm -hmm. uh, which means that if you're using passwords that, that make it on these lists, it's called a known password. And the reason that matters is because if I am a criminal and I'm going to try to hack your accounts, I'm going to take this long list of known passwords and I'm going to use them against your accounts to see if you've used anything that's already a previously known password. There you go. So that's why that's bad. Well, and you know what else is bad for is brute force attacks mm -hmm. because we just got an alert from like every security FBI, CISA, Department of Home, like all of the different groups, just like six of them who said there's an active brute force attack happening all over the place right now. And a brute force attack is when they just sit there and the computers are literally just, they're just pounding away, trying to log into anything that's exposed. Mm -hmm. And they write code that runs through list of users' names and then just runs through those passwords. And it's hard to handle when people use the same username and password in multiple places. <laughs> no, you don't want. So, so, so fixed passwords, those... Um... You know, those are passwords you're never changing. You're never updating. Mm -hmm. you, you got one and that's it. So look at your policies. You know, how often are passwords uh, being changed? How often should they be changed? You should have a policy around that. 
and you may have to have multiple pieces. So you might have certain things where the password is updated annually, other things it might be updated every 90 days, but <laughs> figure those things out. Certainly don't leave them the same. Uh, and then of course, default passwords should go without saying, but wow, <laughs> the number of things that get connected that people it don't should go without saying, yeah, people don't change the default passwords. I mean, uh, I actually was telling a guy's story yesterday, how our local courthouse had, this has been several years ago, but you know, me having a little bit of time on my hands and sitting across from the courthouse, parked on the side of the road, I, you know, whip out my laptop. I'm like, let's see what I can connect to. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. Yeah. I, and honestly, I thought maybe a small business around, you know, somewhere in the area close enough for me to pick up on my laptop, you know, I'd be able to just kind of poke around to see, you know, how bad things are. It, no, it was the county courthouse that I, they had the, the default credentials on their uh, firewall. Yeah. Yeah. Sure did. Well, did you, what did you do, David? I said, holy cow. <laughs> did, you, did you put on your cape and mask and come running in? <laughs> uh, I, I Fortunately, because I live in a small town, you know, I'm, I know people in, that are in government. So I just kind of forward the information along to the people that can get it fixed. And as far as I know, I think they, they ended up just replacing the, the hardware altogether because even the hardware itself wasn't really business hardware. <laughs> uh, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, all that being said, I am sure being a County, they probably had it staff that put this thing in place. It didn't, you know, didn't change it. They didn't change the password. So, you know, you shouldn't always assume necessarily that whoever's doing your IT internal or external are doing these things. That's why you have to have checklists. You have to have assessments that you're doing because maybe, maybe an annual assessment would have caught this if they went in and said, let's do an assessment of uh, the security of the router mm -hmm. firewall. And then they might've found out that, Oh, well, you never change these default credentials. And that's why it's important to do these audits periodically. Um, whether you're auditing, Everything or just, hey, let's pick one thing this month and audit it. Yeah. But but do it. Preach it, brother. Preach it. I is. I is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So those are the bad practices. Only two for now. I'm sure the list will grow. As the list grows, we will continue to share. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll come up with like a song called Bad Practices to the Bad Company song. <laughs> 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 Who knows? I uh, love it. All right. So that brings us to the topic of the day show, which is to offshore to not offshore. And dun, um, dun, dun, dun. yep. And so shout out to Steve Dempsey. Uh, he and I are in uh, the tech tribe, which is an online membership for MSPs and MSP owners. And I'm kind of the, the hippo guru of the site as, as often happens. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, Steve, you know, really big shout out to him because every single time he hear he sees the word HIPAA, he at mentions me in the forums. Yeah. And so he's, he does a fantastic job of, of roping me into a lot of conversations, but this time he actually had a question himself. And basically he was looking at, um, being able to have overseas technicians you know, they own all the computers, they own all the tools, they're monitoring and managing their employees. Um, but they wanted to know, or he wanted to know, you know, can, can his company be HIPAA compliant or at least service companies that need to be HIPAA compliant, but still have technicians that are overseas. In other words, does HIPAA have anything to say about keeping uh, employees within the United States? So, you answered him. You did really well. There's another one. <laughs> Here's David. <laughs> he hit the ground running on that one. And uh, you gave him all the things that they have to worry about. From an MSP perspective, this is a huge question these days. Mm -hmm. But it also applies to transcription companies. There's a lot with transcription and medical records and billing and coding. There are so many vendors in healthcare that want to um, 
you know, it's, it, what was it? We were just talking about that your payroll goes down because you're outsourcing overseas. Uh, but at the same time, what happens to my data? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, we've known, especially in the IT business, this is something that's been happening for a very long time. You know, mm -hmm. you call, you call Dell support, you're going to get overseas. You call Lenovo support. I mean, you, you name it, Microsoft. I mean, they're, they all do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of it is it's definitely an economic decision because you can hire so many more people, um, cheaper than you can here. And, um, it, you know, it's just, an, Man, it's there's a, another value too, because when you're sleeping, they're working. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, it, and in some cases, you, you know, you look at the small IT companies like, like mine, for example, if, if I wanted to hire, for example, a level three server engineer, um, and I need to provide that to my clients, I mean, there's a drastic difference in cost when you look at something like that. So, um, again, it becomes an economic decision, but if, if I can't afford to bring in that level of person while also spreading the cost out over all my client base, then my clients absolutely can't afford it. They're just never going to get that level of service. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a, it's a tougher conversation that's getting harder and harder within our industry, especially when you're going out there and you're providing proposals to people and you know, your competition is outsourcing and you're not, mm -hmm. and therefore they can bring the cost down a lot or be a lot more competitive because they don't have the same internal cost. Well, and so first let's get it really clear here. HIPAA does not say a word about this. Mm -hmm. There is no rule anywhere that says this cannot be done. Right. So let's, let's make that clear from the get-go. What HIPAA does say is that you need to do a security risk analysis of where your data comes and goes and who has access to it. Mm -hmm. So you need to do a security risk analysis of this service and overseas uh, outsourcing, mm -hmm. offshore, uh, whatever they're calling it today whatever the kids are calling it today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's called a distributed workforce. <laughs> there you go. There, there's it, it's offshoring outsourcing distribution. I don't know. Yeah. But the bottom line is if you're going to hire people that are outside the United States, you have to evaluate what that impact is. And then as David said, clearly in his answer to Steve document, 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 and prove that you have taken all the reasonable and appropriate steps to identify and mitigate any risk that you face. Mm -hmm. And that's the answer for, can I do this under HIPAA for most technology? For most things besides when we're talking about what I can do from a privacy perspective and access to records and those things, you don't have to, you have to evaluate the law as well as the risk, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of technical decisions should be based on the risk to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So that being said, uh, when you look at doing this uh, from an MSP perspective, uh, you have different concerns than folks that are looking at doing it from a transcription or billing perspective because your case they're not necessarily they have the keys to the kingdom they can do whatever they want mm -hmm. but most people don't see it that big of a deal because they don't get the data to me it's in a lot of ways bigger deal because not only do they have the ability to get to everything but they also know what to do when they get there mm -hmm. You know, so that assumption of how many times do we hear a, a MSP tell us we don't have to worry about it because we don't access the EMR? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> I always love David's face when we hear one of those or read one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it it gets down to 
evaluate your specific scenario, number one. Number two, you better have a really good BAA in place. And it needs to be one that you develop and that attorneys that understand the laws in other countries where you're doing it, because you could have somebody sign a contract that says you are forced to follow the HIPAA law as it is defined in the United States. However, how enforceable is that contract in that country where they are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that that brings up some of the issue um, that we often have, which is if somebody does something awry, <laughs> where Nefarious. does yes, where <laughs> where does the responsibility fall? And you know, in most cases, really the answer is it's it's not really a whole lot different whether they're in the United States or not. If you're the the covered entity and the patients are, are yours, even if whether they're a vendor from the U.S. or overseas, it still falls on you. You still have to, to notify um, unless you've outsourced that piece of it. But the patients are yours. The data is yours. The breach becomes yours. <laughs> yeah. So it really matters to you to know as Steve mentioned, of whether or not uh, there are outsourced techs. And if there are, you want a lot of detail about how that's managed. Mm -hmm. and because I, I, we ask a ton of questions when we find out about anybody shipping stuff overseas. And I think in, uh, in Steve's case, I'm not 100% sure, but I think in other things I've seen him talk about this, he's actually building his own team. He's not outsourcing to another company. So again, that again that opens up a whole nother can of worms because mm -hmm. now you're dealing with basically hiring people directly, and you don't have a company that you can uh, make sure is enforcing things for you. Yeah, and and of course it also gets back to um, understanding that difference of you're going to try to enforce something in an area of the world you know nothing about. You don't meet the person one-on-one. -on -one. You don't understand the environment where they're working. There's a lot of variables that you have to deal with if you're doing that one-on-one -on -one kind of employment with someone overseas. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do it when you're hiring a company. Yep. Yeah, but they can do a lot, a lot of, of There's a lot of stories of things that didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well here's here's a question too donna and um i'll give my piece of it but the question becomes if you are we'll say an msp and you are providing services to your clients and you are outsourcing things do you have any obligation morally or otherwise to let that client know that that's happening no not that I know of. However, if I ask you, you have an obligation to tell me the truth. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's why we say uh, in our assessment of business associates, will anybody, you know, is all of our data kept in the United States? Will, you know, will you be using overseas workforce? And those kind of questions are hugely important mm -hmm. because well, that's I want to understand how you're managing them. That's why I bring it up, because let's let's say, for example, that I have technicians that are that are overseas, but my client doesn't know that. And if you come in and you do an assessment of my client and you ask them, is your IT support at any point outsourced overseas? They may say, no, it's not. It's local. But that's why I tell when I come in, I tell those clients they need to ask you those questions. Mm -hmm. They need to vet those vendors for a reason. Right. And worrying about supply chain controls is absolutely essential today. We've been pushing it since the get go. I mean, you and I've talked about it from the beginning of the podcast, the importance of vetting your vendors mm -hmm. and, and how we knew this is where we're going. So I would ask them and they would say, no, it's local. Great. Let's ask them. Right. But it, it does get down to that. But then I accept that I also have to ask, do you make sure that you ask? 
if anything's overseas. So let's say you're not sending anything overseas, but then you're outsourcing to somebody. Do you ask them? And so you have to go down the whole tail and that's where the problem comes in. Yeah. Well, I know with us, we don't outsource overseas at this time, but we have vendors that we outsource things to that outsource <laughs> things overseas. Yeah. And so we have to understand what, what that is and what those complexities are. But even though we uh, currently aren't doing that, we kind of are doing that because our vendors are doing it. Well, and that's another thing that gets back to people that are, uh, you know, when we talk about the software uh, work, the software supply chain and having software, secure software development, a ton of software development happens overseas. Mm -hmm. a lot of it and when you look at that and i say oh well i don't have to worry about i'm gonna i'm gonna worry about just the basics which is what somebody was in a conversation on linkedin with me of why are we worried about secure software development when most people aren't doing the basics and i'm like uh we have to in healthcare assume that you are doing the basics and then ask about how you're managing these things on purpose because the supply chain is, is crushing to healthcare. And there's a lot of vendor issues that are coming into play. And part of a secure software development framework is to make sure that if you do have development happening overseas, that code is evaluated and confirmed that there's no back doors, there's no code that doesn't belong uh, any of those things happening. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the pressing question <laughs> is no, but yes. And document, document, document so that you can prove that you knew no, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it, again, it's, it's complexity, right? It, it adds a lot of complexity to it and you can't treat it the same. So, no. um, as long as you've done your due diligence and, and you're probably doing more due diligence than you do for your local folks, mm -hmm. um, that that's the main thing you, you want to be able to show that when something goes wrong, cause it probably will, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that you can prove you were doing everything reasonable and appropriate to, to try to avoid that from happening. But, uh, but anyway, that's, it's a great question though. To yeah. offshore or to not I offshore. I don't think that you're going to be able to avoid dealing with that. Mm -mm. I mean, you're not. You need to prepare that somewhere down the line, you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, you know, I had a friend of mine that was an attorney that spent a ton of time working for a healthcare consulting firm. And he left because he desperately wanted out of healthcare. But he would review BAAs a ton. And even years ago, it was, we do not want a BAA that says I can't offshore. Mm -hmm. I want BAAs that understand that sometimes we're going to need to do that, but I'm responsible for making sure that it's handled properly. Right. And there are ways to do it, mm -hmm. but you've got to take the time. Yeah. I I know, um, I know of a lady I ran into a few years ago and she ran a medical uh, coding billing company and, um, and, and she had her entire staff outsourced overseas. Whoa. Uh, and, and I was blown away because this was back when, you know, outsourcing overseas wasn't quite as prevalent in a small organization. Yeah. And, uh, I was like, wow, something is. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of freaking out about doing it for IT and we don't have direct access to medical records. They have direct access to medical records and they're sending it overseas. And I'm like, man. Well, and know. the other thing you have to worry about is we've dealt with this recently is a company that has been vetted and you knew they didn't use anything overseas is now purchased by a company that does mm -hmm. do overseas. That's true. So when there's an acquisition, you need to do your vetting again and decide if you're willing to take on that risk. Mm -hmm. So I, you want to ask them if they're doing it and how they're managing that risk, if they are, so that you can determine if you're going to take on that risk. Don't think you're not taking on the risk. Mm -hmm. 
you're taking it on. So anybody that you're hiring people where you're worried about, you know, crossing I's and dotting T's, but you're not asking these questions, that is where things are going to go horribly awry. Tis true, she says. (laughs) (laughs) All right, folks, that is our answer for that question. And that's our show for today. So. Remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site, rate our podcast, leave us a review, help spread the word. And remember for Donna and myself, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care.